one of the, the quali- uh, units we deliver as part of the qualification is sports psychology. And we always have students saying, oh, I want to be a sports psychologist in the future. I want to, I want to work with athletes. So you've obviously done that. You, you, you've, you know, you've got a solid education, but you've got some unbelievable experiences. Um, so now uh, you're, you're a psychologist with Chimp Management. You've worked with the Rugby Union, um, GB Taekwondo, British Canoeing, for example, in the uh, London 2012 Olympics. Uh, and you've done a whole host of other things. But if we could just start really by saying, what is the job of a psychologist? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, good morning, everybody. And I think we'll get a little bit of interaction, but I'm going to try and cover as much as I can so that anyone that's listening takes that, that little piece. But it, you know, it might not be relevant to you. You might not even think sports psychology is your career, but just take something you can if you want. Um, what is the job of a sports psychologist? Uh, am I allowed to share my screen? Is that, is that please cool? Do, please, yeah, please do, Robert. I'll share this. So I guess this is a key point for me. So I primarily now call myself a psychologist and I, and I work in sports and I work in other performance areas. So that, that's a, the first little thing. But when you go into the world of sport, often there's, there's a big kind of debate. Are you going to go in and help people to perform at their best? And I would kind of say, if you just think, well, what do you mean perform? If you ask the individual person in front of you, what is it you're trying to do? And they might say, actually, I, I just want to be a bit happier. I just want to enjoy my sport a bit more. So you end up with this kind of like, you know, a continuum of like well-being, performance, developing the person, developing the team. So it really is quite wide ranging. Um, this, this is what I would describe mine in a nutshell. You know, if somebody said to me, what is it that you do? I help people to understand their mind and how to manage their emotions, their thinking, their behavior. Okay, so if you think about what I just said there, let's say you've got one of these athletes and you meet them first time and you ask them, how's it going? And they say, not great, my confidence isn't brilliant. You're gonna work with that person to help them understand their own mind so they can improve their own confidence. That's the relationship I've got, really. I certainly haven't got a magic wand to, to wave it for them. So um, I hope that maybe answers what I do. It but, does, yeah. And, and I think we, we'll have loads of questions on the back of uh, that introduction. Well, yeah. let, let's roll the clock back to when uh, you were the, the same age as these guys. Was psychology something you were always interested in? Or how did that all come about? Yeah, so I mean, I was a sportsman. I uh, played a lot of rugby, played, played to a good standard of rugby. And I had a first ACL uh, knee injury, had surgery, came back from that. Had a second ACL injury the next season, came back from that. And at my third ACL, uh, if anyone's ever had one ACL, you'll know it's not great. So at three, my surgeon said to me, you know, you, you're going to have to give this up because uh, you, you're making my reputation bad. So uh, I gave up, I retired from rugby and I basically loved psychology at A-level. I just found it really interesting. So when I went to university, I decided to study psychology. And uh, we can talk later about the training pathways, okay? But the key thing is, I started on psychology and I didn't like it. I actually got into my second year and I decided there was nowhere near enough sport. I needed more sport. So I changed in my second year at university to sports science. So I'd like to think I've got, when people say, do I do sports science or do I do psychology? I could probably tell you a bit about both of them. But that's, that's how I got into it. And then once you're at university, you start learning theory and obviously you start learning skills. And I think that's that probably the beginning of me being more formally training as a psych. All right, brilliant. Well, let's take us on a little bit of a journey then, if you could, please, Robbie. Just from finishing university, uh, obviously change subject. Uh, talk us through your first sort of job within psychology and then the journey that you've been on since. So um, it's probably like a, a, a pivotal moment in my kind of training, my journey. So I'd started working at British Canoe and I'd, I'd offered to do it for free. So I just said to them, you know, I finished my university degree. I'd gone traveling, but I'd got a little bit of work experience. I went to Australia just to be a backpacker, but I, I went and knocked on the door of the Australian Institute of Sport and asked for some work experience. So when I came back, I really knew that I needed to train more. And I went to Canoe and I offered to do free workshops. And they said to me, absolutely great to have you in but you need to go and meet this chap, uh, Professor Steve Peters, he is now, and you need to meet him because we might start to use his model. So just put yourself in this boat, okay? I go to a service station, uh, like, you know, just at the side of the, one of the big motorways, and I'm just a young, out of university kind of young guy, and I've got this doctor, this professor, and the first question he asked me, just like point to my face was, how much do you know about the brain? Mm-hmm. And of course, remember, I'd switched to sports science. So I knew a lot about physiology. I knew a little bit about psychology, but I didn't know a lot about the brain. So Steve gets out this napkin, because we're literally at like a coffee stand in, 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 a, in a Costa or whatever it was. He gets out a napkin, gets out his pen, 
and he starts to draw the human brain and he started to give me an understanding of it right there and right then. And what he basically said was, and you can ask yourself this, do you ever do things, you know, overeat or do you ever have thoughts or feelings that you just would rather not have? And of course I thought, well, yeah, of course I have those kind of, you know, I worry about exams. And he said, right. He said, I want you to stop. And I thought, well, I can't just stop. And he said, right, well then that's what you need to understand. You need to understand your mind. And what he'd shown me on this napkin was basically this. This is his model. Okay, I don't know if anyone's ever, ever heard of the chimp model. Well, what he basically got me to start to realize, that a very, this is a basic level, is that there's different systems in your brain. Some of them you control. So that's when we're, when we're calm and we're controlling, we're, we're planning maybe is what we want to do in our career. But at other times, other systems are in charge, have got the blood flow in our brain. And that's when we'll often do, do things we often later regret. So he just introduced this model and, I, and he showed me that on a napkin. And I thought, well, that helps me because I know now my chimp brain is, you know, I'll give you an example. Who's ever had one of these? <laughs> this, this is a snack accident. Yeah, I can see a few show of hands. All right. You know, this is like you get that tube of Pringles and your logical brain says there's enough for every day of the week. And your chimp brain says, give me the tube, you know, and, and they're down. Okay. So you start to get this recognition. You think, yeah, that's, that's relatable. And I feel if I can take that same insight, understanding of your mind in sport, then it's not my job to tell someone they're thinking right or, or behaving right. It's my job to help them look at how they're thinking. Does that, does that make sense? It's slightly different. I'm not going to tell you what to think or do. I'm going to help you understand how you think so then you can start to look at it if it's helpful for you. Brilliant. Could you give us a, a few ideas then and a few examples of people who you've used that uh, theory with? This is like we're, we're, we're on the same wavelength here. We're tuned in here, Mark. So this <laughs> is a, a couple of the contracts over the years. So uh, canoeing, like I said, I actually went in voluntarily at the start just to get my foot in the door. And then I, I got a contract from them and I started delivering uh, with what's called their podium potential. So athletes that can go into the Olympics and they're trying to develop them as much as they can. And obviously canoeing, if you imagine like a 100 meter sprint race, uh, often it's quite what you'd call a closed sport in as much as you've got a start and you've got a finish and there's not very much competition uh, in, in, you know, it's not a physical uh, battle in terms of against somebody else. But of course you're competing against other people. But I guess what I'm saying is in terms of your mind, you're very much focused on your process, you know, and, and really finishing that race. So that was a great time. It was a brilliant opportunity. But then when I got the opportunity to go to Taekwondo, I thought, Okay, here's another, you know, completely different world now. You've got canoeing where you're on your own, completely individual. And then you've got taekwondo, which obviously is individual, but now it's a, it's a combat sport. So, you know, there's a whole different set of, of, of kind of uh, psychology that comes with that. So taekwondo is great. Again, really good Olympic program. They really get the best out of their athletes. They really support the athletes to be as best as they can be. But there's a lot of psychology going on around uh, responding to your opponent whereas in canoeing typically you're trying to maximize your race Do you know what i mean so that was that was really interesting to compare those two worlds and then the one on, on the left of your screen you can see there is when i moved into professional rugby union and now that's a whole different world again because you've now got you versus somebody else but you've also got you within a team and obviously you can go from if in taekwondo i could be working with one athlete i can now be working with 40 athletes in a rugby squad if we could start then, because at the bottom right of our screen there, there's uh, Jay Jones uh, obviously competing in Taekwondo. It's funny actually because Jay Jones was a, uh, when she was younger, she went to Flint High School, and that's one of the partner schools we work with at LLS. So some of the students in on the call today are actually from Flint High School. That's where they study in sixth form. So just tell us if the likes of Jay Jones, she's preparing for a, a big competition. How does your day-to-day -day role look? What type of things are you working on with someone such as her? Yeah. So when you work with any athlete, what, what you, my approach, and obviously different people will have different ways of doing things, but my approach and, and what commonly is promoted for psychologists is to work with everybody as an individual. You know, so uh, clearly just because, for example, if I've got five female athletes in front of me and they all could be competing for the same spot at the Olympics, it doesn't mean I'm going to use the same approach every single one of them because they could all have very different mindsets, different approaches to the sport. They might have different fears. You know, so one person might be really excited about competing 
and they're, they're really going there to try and win. And another person, because of what's happened recently in training, might be thinking, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm just not feeling confident about this competition. So you have to adapt to every single person you've got. And depending on how much time you get of a sport. So if, when I was at Taekwondo, I was full time. So you get, you, know, you go to trainings, you get time to uh, talk with the athletes after it. Uh, when you're at rugby, you could be in the hotel, you could be at the team meal. So you really have to make sure that what you're doing is trying to individualize your approach to every single person and you're trying to fit with often what is the constraints of the contract. You know, if you're one day a month in a football team, then you have to think about, is it going to be group-based stuff? Do I do it as a workshop or do I get the manager to tell me, no, there's only three players I want you to work with. And if they want to work with you, then we're happy for that. So you end up negotiating quite a different delivery for every contract. That's interesting. So if we could take that across to rugby, um, could you give us an example of how, the, the types of things you might do if the manager decides he wants you as the sports psychologist to work with the team as a, a group? What, what type of activities would you be doing as a psychologist there? Yeah. Um, so, so in my practice, because I, I showed you earlier the, the, the chimp model that Steve showed me back in uh, 2008. So I work for chimp management, which means typically when people come to our company, they would like us to use the chimp model. So... Uh, and, and often I'll discuss that up front with a client. If they say, no, I don't want to use that model, fine, I would adapt it. But to answer your question directly, if a, a club has asked me to go in there and do a workshop, for example, with a big group, I will, like I showed you very briefly earlier, have you ever had, you know, a, a Pringles disaster? And we can all relate to that. My objective in a workshop is to try and get people thinking about their brain. So that, that is the way I work. It's, you probably call it psycho education. So you're trying to educate people around psychology but you're trying to give them the toolkit, not hold the toolkit. So in an hour, it might be a little bit about, let's have a look at our brain, let's have a look at how it's working, is it helpful, is it unhelpful? And then hopefully what you get at the end of that first session is people leaving with some questions. You know, okay. some questions and maybe one or two ideas, and then often that is your first way into a club, is to try and generate more questions than to try and pretend that you know it all, which you tell yeah. Brilliant, so you know, one of the things, these are obviously elite level uh, athletes on the screen now, but am I right in saying that you work with elite level performers, so that that transfers away from the world of sports? Because we're always talking to, to the you know the, the students who are here on the call today. We're always saying you know when you work in sports, very often a lot of the skills uh, that you gain are transferable. So you may well you know for example some of the, the young people in the room will start off potentially as young coaches and then you might try to transfer and you know go work in an area such as analysis or sports science so is that something that's happened to you you've potentially you know started in sport and then moved into other areas as well yeah i mean i think you're right and again it depends um i don't know if it does depend what degree you do because i'm a bit more of a believer it's about kind of what you make of yourself uh, you know i know plenty of people who trained in one thing and, and really grew in another area so i don't i don't think for example what i was thinking off the top of my head was a sports science degree is quite a broad footing. So you'll get a little bit of physiology, a little bit of psychology, you know, and what that might mean is later you could maybe specialize in a certain area. But, you know, I know people who studied law and are now fantastic psychologists. So, you know, I think we're just trying to keep an open mind. For me, when I learned, um, oh, I think that's the wrong slide, I'll show you later. When I learned that about the brain again, it enabled me to then go to different sectors. So if I work with, um, let's say I work with uh, a, a, a leader, of a company and he might be saying to me you know I, I need to manage this team but at the moment I don't feel good in myself then we're going to apply some of the same skill set to him we're going to get him to have the chance to reflect work out what it is that is actually giving him conflict and what are his alternatives and over time if he works on that clearly his probabilities of being a better leader improve I'll give you I'll give you I'll, I'll give you the next slide to really show you this so when when I left uh, the one of the premiership clubs I went to to England and England rugby basically had an idea which was let's develop our rugby players as best as we can you know in their development journey so that by the time they get to international level we're maybe not doing as much what you'd call late psychology you know so it's kind of plant the seed early and then really enjoy the kind of crop a bit later so we went in there and basically England said look help us maximize our talent and they put a big team around it I was just one person within a team but what I was trying to bring as a psychologist was to say, I believe that hot, good rounded people also tend to make good rounded athletes. You know, now 
then somebody might say, well, what do you mean good? You know, it's not my job, like I told you earlier, to say what good and bad is. My job is to create learning experiences where people think, wow, I'm challenging my perception. So here's a little quick video. This is when we uh, took the lads to the riot police in London and put them through their paces. We've been at the Graves Island Police Training Centre and they've just literally been running through what they'd be training their students here. So this morning we did um, entry with an enforcer, 16 kilograms of, of metal, which was pretty heavy. And then we did some abseiling, um, which I think was 30 metres. And we finished off with, um, with a long run, which ended with some uh, drills, which was uh, really good fun. It's all about working in a team, really, um, especially in those sort of things with a big shield. You have to work in pairs, uh, so you've got to be on the same page, chat to each other, so communication is key. We did casualty recovery, um, looking to recover bodies from a, in, a, in a building, work closely in a team together. We had to think of a, think of a sort of game plan, um, and then physically quite tiring as well, having to carry the bodies as well. He we looked at like gathering evidence, um, so we're put under quite quite a lot of pressure. So we faced uh, public violence, people chucking bricks, uh, petrol bombs, and stuff. Um, and it's yeah, it's looking at how we worked closely as a team under pressure uh, in chaotic sort of circumstances. I'm usually quite good at performing under pressure, but I think that got to me quite a bit. Um, and obviously with the the misty steam over your face as well, you can't really see much. It uh, all gets to you a bit. Johnny Wilkinson was in yesterday and had a chat with us and sort of said you can dictate how you feel in a certain situation. Um, so, say, take the abseiling, for instance. If you just thought about yourself and the rope and how to get down, then you'll do all right. Whereas if you take in all the elements, look down, look at what's around you, then that's what actually makes you fear it. So, basically focusing on yourself and not allowing the surroundings to get to you. Cool. So, I mean, I, you know, I think something like that program is what you, you probably think is like the top level of sport because obviously, uh, you know, you, you do need a budget to be able to do that. And we had a big team of people. So that was, that was really helpful. But if you kind of hopefully heard a few things that people were talking about there, self-regulation, you know, actually it's okay being able to regulate yourself in a rugby pitch, but actually when somebody's chucking firebombs at you, being able to manage your emotions, keep yourself calm, we get them doing thinking exercises, like actually are you, are you searching for facts or are you just jump into an opinion? Obviously we get kind of guest lectures in. Now, that for me is what you'd call really experiential psychology. So you put people in an experience and they just learn from the experience and you're not really telling them what to be or do. You're just giving them the chance to grow. And obviously that would be quite um, holistic of the whole person. And whereas me one-on-one -on -one with a person in a room talking about how they're going to manage their emotions or their thinking for the next game would obviously be the under end, other end of the scale. I think that's really interesting that actually, Robbie, and, and I've just noted down what one of the young, uh, young men on the video said. He said, you know, focus on yourself and don't let the, uh, the surroundings get to you when he was referring to abseiling down a building. And I think that's quite relevant now to the situation that we find ourselves in. So we're really conscious as an organisation right now. Some of our second year students who've just completed the qualification with us this month, um, some of those young people had secured paid employment coaching abroad this summer. Um, other students have secured places at the first church university. Um, but, but in both of those examples, there, the guys are you know, due to be flying off abroad and, and working this summer. The chances are that's not going to happen. Uh, for the guys who are looking to go to university, they don't know how that's going to look. They don't know whether that's going to be taught online. They don't know whether they're going to be working, moving away from home. They're just completely unsure. And it's the same for some of the, the students who are starting with LLS this September. We don't quite know, as of right now, whether they're going to be getting taught online or whether it's going to be a, a blend of learning. So if we can link that back to, to you as a psychologist, is, is there any sort of tips or advice that you give to the young people um, in terms of dealing with a situation like we're in now? Yeah, I mean, it is, I'll, I'll move this on, so we're away from the rugby stuff a little bit. I'm, I'm going to leave that up there. It might help us in a minute. But 
first and foremost, it is difficult. I, I mean, you know, the situation we're in at the moment is universally different for everybody. Okay, so I, I really empathise that anybody that's in a situation where they're thinking things that felt like they were in your control aren't in your control anymore. That obviously gives us a reaction. And I think the key thing to remember here is try and almost accept what you can't control. So often what will happen is people want to hold on to things they feel they should be able to control. So, you know, I should be going and this should. So actually what's really upsetting you is the fact that you're holding on to it quite a lot. And part of the skills we're trying to help people to develop is the ability to go, right, let me accept that I don't control the, the current global situation, but what I do control is how I respond to the situation. You know, and, I, and that sounds a bit cliche because people might say, oh, it's easy for you to say, but I'm just saying it's a skill base. If you look at what's on the screen now, it's a skill base to say you've got a strong emotional system, this chimp system that's going, I want it my way and I want to be able to go where I want to go. And that's absolutely right that it, it should want that. But we have to be realistic. We have to bring in that blue part of our brain and think the facts are I can't. And the facts are I can make my own plan for what I do in the meantime. Great stuff. Um, so I'm just conscious of time and I know we've, we've got students who've been getting in touch in the last day or so with different questions. Um, but if we could just focus now, we always ask uh, specialists uh, like yourself, what sort of skills, if anyone's sitting there now listening and thinking, I love what, what Robbie's saying, I love the idea of working as a, a sports psychologist in the future, what skills do you think that they should be, if, if we could say three top skills that they should be focusing on developing from now moving forwards, what yeah, would be the okay. why? I love this. So I've just finished my PhD, which is the height of geekiness, by the way. I never thought I'd be that much of a geek, guys. If you're thinking this guy is too much of a geek, trust me, I didn't think I was going to do this. But I did a bit of research on that, and I'm going to go back to share screen. This is what I found after 30 years of research. I looked at it all, compiled it all together. This is what the top sports psychologists are about. This is what coaches are saying, athletes are saying, sports psychologists themselves are saying. They're saying, you need to know stuff. You know, you need to go and study and read and have some ideas. You need some knowledge to bring to the, to the dance, okay? But also, you need these qualities. So what do I mean qualities? I mean, it's more about you as a person. So are you trustworthy? You know, um, are you a good listener? You know, and, and you might say, well, actually, listening is a bit more of an action. Fine, that's why they all interlink to that bit in the middle where you're saying you at your best would be you're learning a little bit, you're showing up as a nice person, you're caring, you know, and you're doing helpful things. You may be asking helpful questions. And all of that will come from either kind of structured learning or just experience and reflecting on it from time to time. You know, just thinking, right, how, how am I going at the moment? And am I good in myself? Am I happy in myself? If not, what's happening? What can I do to change it? If you get good at managing yourself, you tend to be pretty helpful psychologists to other people. And I suppose if I was going to make that real, real simple, this would probably be my three tips. You know, that's what I would look at. And I would just think, be as proactive as you can. Like, go and send emails to people. Ask to have a day with somebody. I, I asked a psychologist when I was in sixth form if I could have a day with him at British Boxing. It was brilliant. You know, I went and just stood there and watched it, and it was great. You know, it hooked me in. Um, so that's the proactive part. The invest in yourself part is where I'm saying you will be the professional. You know, like you, you will be the person. It doesn't matter if you're sports psych or something else. So I'm saying, why not have a look at something like the chimp model or, or another approach and see if you can understand your own mind. Because if you get it in you at 16, 17, 18, 19, then you're not going to have the same battles at 30, 40, 50 that a lot of people think, oh, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can, you can, but I'm saying get ahead of the curve. And then last but not least, again, sounds cliche, but I really believe this. Just do, try and do something you enjoy. Because the way the world works at the moment, we tend to work for five days and rest for two. I don't know who made those rules. But if you're going to work for five days, do something that you enjoy. You know? And if you don't enjoy it very often, then I'd say maybe have a look back at point one and see if you can be proactive. <laughs> Excellent. That, that's really, really, it's brilliant. I have really enjoyed listening to you, Robbie. And we always say we, we could ask questions for hours because it's, it's interesting what you're talking about. We think it's really important to give the students the opportunity to ask some questions as well. Um, sure. So what we'll, we'll do, if I can, uh, guys who are in the room, um, there's two ways you can do this. Uh, Mike is going to be keeping an eye on the screen. So you can either uh, post a question for Robbie uh, in the chat 
Or if you just put your thumbs up emoji on the screen, Mike will come to you shortly. Um, so we're going to start off, first question. Quite an interesting one. This is from Ethan. So Ethan has said, what is the most difficult obstacle in your career that you've come across and how did you, you know, overcome it? Um, brilliant question. Re really good question. So I think there's a, there's a couple. For me personally, it would have been just, you know, the challenges I faced as an athlete. You know, I, I really hit a low because I was, I was playing good level sport and I was looking towards maybe making that my career. And, you know, one hit is bad. Two hit is not great. Three hit, you really really suffer and I don't think that was tough so what, what did that give me it gave me in hindsight now I'm a bit older I look back it gave me a great learning experience so if you're going through a tough time I completely get when you're in that kind of tunnel it's a horrible place to be all I would say is lean on people around you get get some support it can just be a friend it doesn't have to be you know professional get some support to get out of where you are and now I look back and I think that was probably the toughest thing I had but it really made me hungry to go and help other people brilliant uh, next question, this is about sort of um, forward planning and, and their goal setting. We've got a question from Chloe, which is, where do you see yourself or your careers five years from now? God, I love this. I might get you to write these down and I'll, I'll do it in more thorough reflection. Um, so, you know, for, for me, there's different people have different preferences. Some people like to plan and they want to, you know, have a vision of where they're going. So a lot of athletes work that way. You know, they want to go to a certain Olympics and then we work backwards. Other people have a philosophy, which is, I'm just going to live every day because, for example, I, I don't know how long, you know, what I'm going to do in five years' time. So I want to make the most of where I am now. I probably sit somewhere in the middle. So I'm really enjoying trying to make the most of every day at the moment, you know, adapt to a situation like everybody else is. Equally, you know, I would like in five years' time to have a family, you know. So I'm kind of keeping that balance of, like, personal and professional aspects. But ask me that question again in five years' time, and it might have changed. So, you know, just try and enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the ride, really. Of course. Um, so for this one, I'm, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to come to Stefan, who's uh, an LLS teacher over in Derry in Northern Ireland. So I think Stefan's with us. Uh, Stefan, would you like to unmute your mic and ask a question to Robbie? Yes, Robbie. Um, my question is just sort of on like a lot of the training and support that you would provide the athletes is a lot of times off the pitch or off the uh, whatever their competition special so rugby, um, the canoeing, that, and also the question that I'm looking at is do you ever actually work alongside the coaches and uh, looking at like game based competition based scenarios and uh, looking at how your athletes perform under pressure? Um, like decisions that they make um, under certain things that are placed in front of them? I mean, again, it's a, it's a really good question. And I, I appreciate in a short amount of time, I've tried to give you a snapshot. If you were to, if I could spend longer, I, I would talk about the work you do with athletes, about performance and about away from performance. You work with coaches about how they engage athletes, the culture they're creating, tactics, you know. So uh, when I was working in rugby, you would often sit with the coaches and it would be everything about, you know, why, why aren't we able to keep momentum up? You know, what maybe is, uh, why is it in football people score a goal and then they always seem to concede a goal? You know, that's a question people will ask you as a psychologist and you're thinking, right, let's have a look at it. So I think you're asking the right question, which is, do you work across, as a sports psychologist typically, do you work across everybody and not only in a consulting room, but also maybe it's pitch side, maybe it's when you're away. The answer for me is I do work across all those areas. Uh, other, other psychologists might say, no, that's not for me. And obviously, again, that's just where professional differences kind of feature. Brilliant. Uh, next person we're going to come to is uh, Lewis Rush. So Lewis is based in our head office in Liverpool and works uh, part of the student engagement team. So uh, Lewis, would you like to unmute your mic for me, please? Yeah. Hiya, Robin. You're OK? Yeah. yeah thanks for that. Um, quite interesting for me personally just my um, my master's degree is based around sports and mental health and stuff like that like when I was doing my studies I, I found myself unexpectedly sw swaying more towards sociology in understanding the psychology side of things if that makes sense to you um, how often do you find yourself combining the two disciplines then when you're helping people to understand the way they think and respond to stuff 
It's a good, it's a good question. So when I, uh, again, just trying to help people that maybe aren't quite familiar what we're on about there. So traditionally, psychology, in a very pure definition, is the kind of science of your thinking and your behavior. So there's a lot of, of, of kind of research gone into that, whereas sociology might be on a, on a more collective level. Okay, So maybe it's less individualistic, more socialistic. So for me, again, it's about what's your interest and how do you apply the knowledge you've got so that it helps other people. So obviously, let's say you've got somebody who's a real specialist just in behaviors. So that's one area of psychology. So they, they, they train people in when this happens, we'll respond in this way. Okay, now they could be really good and they could offer a load of expertise in that area. But you might have somebody else who says, I'm not looking at behaviors, I'm looking purely at thoughts. And they look at that. Now, what I'm trying to say is different expertise can still be effective. And that's what I think when you come in like psychology and sociology, you start thinking, well, if you've got expertise in both and you can blend them together and help people, for example, to understand the culture they've got and what that influence is having on a team, then you're probably going to be you know, better than maybe somebody who's just got one approach. But it's not for me to decide that. It's for me to think, right, I'm going to be the best kind of professional I can be. I've chosen psychology. I do like sociology, but I'd be interested to talk to sociologists a bit more about how you'd approach it because there'll be differences. I'm going to move it back to the students now. So I can see we've got a, a great question and I'm, I'm actually keen for Kai to unmute his mic if we can. So Kai McDowell is a student who studies with us over in Lagan in Northern Ireland. Uh, Kai, could I just ask you to come online and ask this question, please? Hi, Robbie. Uh, so I uh, currently coach, and I'm there, well, they're going into the 15th next season, uh, but most of the age range is 13 to 14. And a lot of them have come to me after a training session or after a game and said, I'm not really sure this is for me uh, going into future seasons. How would I explain that that is mainly um, one of the systems and the lazy side of it getting to them mentally? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a real, real question. So the thing I'm going to go back to is something I've already said. Remember, everybody's an individual. So uh, there can be loads going on for people that we don't always see, you know, and, and what I would be looking to try and help most coaches do is to think, right, can I have a conversation with this person at, at the right time? Because sometimes walking off a pitch, you're right. If somebody's had a bad performance, they might throw down the water bottle and say, I never want to play again. OK, well, we're probably recognising that's a reaction. So that would probably be an, an emotional system reaction. And later on, when they calm down, you might say to them, is everything OK? And they might say, sorry, I'm just having a really bad week. I've got a lot on. So you've seen the blood supply move already. So my advice on this one would be, if you can, especially as a young coach, try and spend a little bit of time getting to know your players a little bit. What, what are they interested in? What are their actual drives? Because often in youth sport, coaches are generally saying, well, how do we develop the young person and if we can, how do we keep them participating in sport? But, you know, equally, we have to be realistic. We're not there to box the kids in and tell them they can't leave if they don't want to. So what I'm saying is if we can connect with the lads or, or the girls and get to know them, really find out what's happening and maybe get them to think, OK, so if you stop playing, what would you do instead? And what would it be like in a couple of years time? But you're not loading them. You're not trying to make them stay because then that young person might think, actually, you're right. If I gave it up, I probably wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't enjoy it. Whereas if they say to you, if I gave it up, I'm, I'm already at the cricket club, you might have to accept that maybe the cricket club's where they want to go. Thank you. Thanks very much for your question there, Kai. That was brilliant. Um, so I'm going to put a couple of questions together here. We've had one from Charlie and we've had one from uh, Paul. Um, Charlie's question was sort of, how do you keep calm when you're having a bad day? And Paul asks, how do you manage the work-life balance? So if we can package that into two questions you know we're having a really bad day in work we're yeah. struggling to we're, we're taking that home with us how, how, do you, how do you get that balance right so um the first thing for me is to understand if you can and, and you know there's lots of good stuff out there you could read try and understand what's happening when you're having a, a bad day so try and understand a little bit like if you didn't eat your breakfast wait if you stayed up really late then you got up um and you didn't eat anything and then you missed your mid-morning bit of food and by the time you got to two o'clock you were feeling pretty irritable then I'd be saying this has got nothing to do with psychology you need to reflect and think if I stay up late and don't eat I am going to be pretty irritable okay whereas if somebody said to me it's not physical that's happening here I keep coming into this environment and I keep feeling you know unhappy about it then for me that's where you can start saying right what what is it that I really want to be happening here now, what is it that maybe I'm expecting? So, for example, if I expect to come into a class and the teacher to really entertain me and the teacher doesn't entertain me, I'm likely to react. I'm likely to be pretty unhappy. But is that the teacher's 
problem or is that my problem? Now, a lot of people say it's a teacher's problem, it's not entertaining you, but I'm going to challenge you and think you're the person that's unhappy because you're looking for the teacher to entertain you. So I'll be saying to somebody, what can you do in the class to get the most out of it? And then people go, okay, that's a different way of looking at it. So for me, it's a, sometimes a balancing act it's on understanding sometimes when you're not really managing your body very well, sleep, uh, social interaction, you know, good. Oh, did we, did we cut out there? Somebody muted me, I think, mid-sentence. Mid <laughs> um, and then I'm going to finish off. Last question. I'm mindful of everyone's time. It's more so yours than anyone's. But if we could just uh, move across. We've got uh, Andy Skiok is uh, one of our senior tutors based over in North Wales. I think Andy has got a question. Are you there, Andy? Yeah, super. Thanks, Mark. Um, just a question to Robbie in terms of... Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of... Um, work from Alistair Cook and he taught, he he followed the, the chimp model but didn't like calling it the chimp I think he used a different term for it um, and what he talked about which I thought was really interesting was at different times when he was playing and in particularly he was batting the, the chimp would, would pop up when he wouldn't want it to so he was in uh, they called the nervous 90s or he was in a p particular position where he was on the field um, and he, he sort of mentioned that that was quite difficult so what sorts of strategies do top athletes use or do you maybe talk about in terms of when that chimp appears at the, the worst time? So, I don't know, going to take a penalty or a real pressure situation, what strategies do they use to try and get rid of that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. If anybody hasn't read any of this stuff and is a bit kind of lost at what we're on about, um, obviously, like I said to you earlier, when, when, when I was first shown this, there's different sections of the brain which have typically different responsibilities, okay? So what we're saying is at certain times, it's a little bit like you've only just found out you've got a right and a left hand. So, you know, you might think, well, I'm right-handed, so I like to write with my right hand. If somebody then made you do it with your left hand, you'd say, I can do it, but it's harder. That's a little bit like the brain. You want to get in the right system so that when you're performing, you're in the right system, otherwise it's a bit harder. So um, I, I, haven't, I haven't worked with Alistair Cook, obviously, so I can't talk about him personally. But what we'll look at with, with a top performer is actually other sections of the brain. So in, in the easy model, the computer, imagine you program this computer and it can bowl a cricket ball straight or it's got really good coordination, okay? Really, that's the part of your brain that you want to be playing your sport in. You know, that is the part, this automatic part that's really quick. You know, it's not really worried about whether it's going to get caught. It's not thinking about what the consequence is going to be. It's just reacting and responding really well. So the skills that you would do to help somebody manage their mind would, again, everyone's individual. I would start before the competition, before the competition and say, what is it that's likely to worry or, or activate that chimp system? And people will tell you, they'll say, well, you know, it's getting caught out or it's getting out for a duck. Right, okay, so let's first and foremost deal with what's gonna happen if you get caught out for a duck. Literally talk me through it. Well, I'll be embarrassed. And then what? Well, I'll walk off. So you, you're just processing it to think, okay, if that really happens, I can survive the worst that is that I get out, okay? Now let's look at how we do my best. Someone's gonna say, right, for me, it's about keeping my body weight forward. But they'll start to coach themselves because you're almost helping them to think, is it maybe it's a process focused thing like you know, uh, concentrating on the ball? Or other people might say, for me, it's about a deep breath. You know, always before I take a penalty, I put that football down, I just take my deep breath, I pick my spot and I stick it in the net. Now, this is, again is for me to have some choices I can offer to people. But what I wouldn't do is go to somebody and say, off the shelf, what you need to do is have a deep breath. And they think a deep breath isn't going to help me because I'm too busy worrying about getting out. So you have to start really kind of getting individual with people. But yeah, there's, there's all sorts of skills around managing your mind. And that's before, during and after you compete. And Robbie, I think that's a brilliant place to finish. Thank you very much for that. Um, for all the, the people who are joining us today, uh, for anyone who wants to do some further reading, we always encourage the young people to try and connect with people from the world of sports. So if we could start by saying, is there anywhere that students can potentially connect with you on social media or LinkedIn? Is there anything, you, any direction you point them in? Uh, so I, I generally don't engage too much on social media. It's just a professional decision I made on the basis of, you know, I typically try and keep everything I do confidential for the for obvious reasons. So I, I've chosen not to. 
Um, but I mean, this is this is. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any rights in this book, so I'm going to do this guy a favour who wrote it. You know, if you're really serious about becoming a sports psychologist, then I would recommend this book, which is called "Being a Sports Psychologist." Being a sports psychologist. Now, it's not going to give you loads of handy tips, and it's not going to give you loads of the kind of what you might call the more sexy psychology. Okay. What it will do is talk to you about what the training looks like, what the actual process as a psychologist looks like, and it will really tune you in to what I would call the nuts and bolts of being a psychologist. So that, that for me is probably slightly more academic, but more around the career. Because then if I'm really honest, if you're interested, read anything. Read people's autobiographies. You know, read what, uh, what your favourite footballer or your favourite athlete has said and really listen to what they're doing to manage their mind. And you start to build this picture because with the nuts and bolts of, you know, sitting down with somebody and consulting, you can add all of the rich stuff on top of that. Um, obviously chimp management, the company I work for, we've got a website. There's a little bit of information on there. And we regularly do conferences or workshops and they're normally quite affordable. So if you want to come and dive into something, come along to an experience, sit in the room, do one of the exercises where you start thinking, wow, I can see my brain a little bit more. Excellent. Look, there's so much uh, we, we'll all take from this talk and I'd like to say on behalf of LMS, thanks very much for that. Uh, what we'll do off the back of this, Robbie, is uh, we'll put a social media post together uh, later this afternoon and we'll also put a link to this uh, video as well. So for anyone who wants to go back and watch the video, you certainly can do. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to say thanks very much for your time this morning. It's been absolutely fascinating listening and hopefully we can we can set something up like this again in the future yeah yeah i mean good luck to everyone i mean that genuinely you know it doesn't seem like that long ago that i was in in kind of a level and thinking what am i going to do and like i said i've changed loads i mean I, that's the one thing i would say is i've changed but along the way i just tried to enjoy it so if that helps people it doesn't have to be like that you know so there we are i'll stop on that thanks very much You're amazing. thank you robbie